Hello and welcome to FTNTS on YT. It's the only YT with FTNTS. My name's Michael May. Come on in. My guest today is Rob Gilbert. Hello, Robert Gilbert. How are you? Hi, Michael May. I'm good. Do you mind if I go with Robert? That's no, what you please want to do. Say. Yeah, please. To avoid the inevitable Rod Gilbert confusion, confusion with Rod Gilbert. Yes, now we said confusion at the same time. Would it be annoying if everyone brought up Rod Gilbert every time they spoke about you doing comedy? As you know. It's tradition around here that we start every episode with uh, me telling my guest how I feel. Is that okay with you? That's fine, yeah. Everyone loves being complimented, ultimately. We've become friends over the last, maybe, what, year and a bit? Yeah. <laughs> Seriously? Yeah, under a year, I'd say. Under a year. January this year? January of 2020, yeah. And so that's when we met? Yeah, 2020, that's yeah, fucking and two I tried, years ago. I tried, uh, no, January t- 2022. <laughs> <laughs> you did. That's this year. When you said January of this year, that's 2022. Yeah, but you said 2020. Did I? Just now, yeah, because you're an idiot. And I have a lot of respect for you. I don't know if you know that. But I do have a lot of respect for you. And a lot of my respect for you comes from your... So you're incredibly self-aware, right? That's the compliment that I'd like to throw out, something in that space. Because I think that there's a this line between self-awareness and self-consciousness that a lot of people don't know how to tread. And sometimes um, I find myself not knowing which one I'm being. And you have this kind of full disclosure and emotional transparency. I targeted you and then eventually you kind of didn't want to hang out with me really. And then one night I made a joke on stage about how Michael looked cute because his t-shirt exactly matched the color of his eyes. And that very night, he came up to me after the gig and said, hey, do you want to go and write together sometime? So you can put that together yourself, ladies and gentlemen. You're able to be vulnerable without it feeling like a burden on the person you're talking to. Like you've shared things with me that I think are quite personal to you. And I've never felt at any point like you're offloading or expecting anything in return. I don't think I was still sat that you still. You were sat so fucking still, man. You look like a, you honestly look like, so, especially with your little short trousers and your white socks, you look like somebody who was... They're off-white. <sighs> All right, listen. You know, Rest in peace, Virgil. I like to be around you. I think that you are good at expressing how you feel in a way that doesn't make me feel strange or put upon. Do you think that's fair? Um... I think that's generous. Yeah, that's a very nice thing to say. Um, yeah, I'd say that's really generous. I th- I think the thing that you said that I'm glad about is that uh, I feel, I, I'm aware of the fact that I'm, I don't mind like talking about how I feel, but mm. I often worry that it will feel like a like I'm requiring something of the other person. Like I'm saying it so that they'll go, oh no, or like that I need something from them. So for you to say like, oh, it doesn't feel like that. I, I like that. I think that you're op- quite open about that, though. That I think... But then I worry, like, is that in itself me trying to make it... You know, it's like when a person, like, has a problematic behavior and rather than fixing it or 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 doing better... Do you ever worry that... Yes. They just go like, oh, God, I'm just like this. I'm just like this. And it's like, yeah, well, why don't yeah. you fucking do something about it then? You know? Yeah, it's the caveat before supposedly offsetting the thing. But I don't think you do that. I think you you seem to enjoy speaking about feelings. Yeah, I just I don't think I I can't really not. It would be it would be absolutely unhinged if you could not speak about your feelings. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but you must you've witnessed me multiple times and been the recipient of and see me. When you come, do you go, I'm coming? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All right. That's pretty cool. Yeah, yeah, I do. You know that, Michael. Like if I if I don't I'll just have to go. I've never made like that much of a connection about like expressing yourself verbally. Yeah, and now I'm it, like, wow, yeah, maybe I do. Fuck, yeah. Because uh, if you're like, I'm coming, then maybe at a moment where you're losing it in the middle of sex, you're like, I'm not going to come anymore. Or like, this doesn't feel as good as it was moments ago. No, I think I'm... I think I'm uh, or like, how many of you are there back there? That kind of thing. <laughs> Usually when I'm about to come, I either say I'm coming or I'm sorry. Like those are the two, those are the two that I would lead with. Really? But I don't think I really would describe, I'm not sort of like, I'm going inside of you and now it feels good. And like, I'm not yeah, going yeah, yeah. to, I you mean, feel. we're getting a bit, we're getting a bit detailed here. Do you but. say I'm excited, stuff like that? I'm ex- no, I've never said I'm excited. I, I will sort of give on a one to 10 scale, like how up for it I am. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. I'll, at the beginning of the night, I'll be like, 
well, I'm at a three. But then, like, yeah. every once in a while, just so that throughout the night, it's, like, building the tension, you know? And then right as you're about to bust, you're like, I'm 10 out of 10 going to bust. <laughs> <laughs> this is 10 out of 10 bussing. That's what I said. <laughs> That'd be sick. This is, this is 10 bussings out of 10. On the bussing scale. On the bussing scale. I'm going to add the bussing scale in here. Ding. That's me on a bus. <laughs> like, I can't really shut my mouth. It's kind of your main thing. Kind of. Did you say that because you genuinely think that's true, or was that like a... I think I was making fun. Yeah. I was seeing how you'd react. It, it would, it, I wouldn't be out of the realms of possibility that somebody would describe me that way, but I agreed, and I don't know whether I do actually agree with that or not. 10 out of 10, bussing is your main thing. <laughs> yeah, 10 out of 10. Bussing 10 out of 10 is my main thing, for sure. Yeah, come in hard, ropes. Well, listen, whatever bussing is to you, it doesn't have to be that, you know? It can be bussing 10 out of 10 can be like you did great on your GCSEs. Bussing 10 out of 10 can be like you did some great charity work. Bussing 10 out of 10 can be just having a nice meal. You know, like I, I, I really made that. I really made that roast. Bussing 10 out of 10. Eat half. Give some to your friend. This, see, this is the tempo of this blade e shit. It's too slow. All right, well, question one. You're no stranger to the spaces in between. You have dual citizenship. You're mixed race. You're a, a polymath, if you don't mind me saying. Um, you're an actor, comedian, writer, director, musician. When and where have you felt like you most belonged? Um, I think just around other people who, who perform. I think there's like something about wanting to turn things that you think and feel into communication through like performance, whatever like form that takes. And there's a certain level of, you know, what I can never decide is either narcissism or like uh, virtue in trying to like describe the human experience. So I think being around comedians, being around actors, being around improvisers, when you are discussed, I think that is a common interpretation that people are impressed by you and want you to like them. And because you're a little bit withholding. Wow. They pursue that. People are mad, aren't they? Yeah, around those people, I feel like the things that I'm self-conscious about myself mm. are probably the least offensive because that those characteristics are probably shared amongst the other people in that space. So you feel like you most belong around other people who perhaps don't belong other places. Is that fair to say? No, not necessarily. I, I think it's, I feel like I belong most around people who can be the, uh, have the least amount of ability to be judgmental of the things about me that I think are bad because they probably are also bad in a similar way. You were sat very, very still. Yeah. Like watching the video, you can see I'm sort of like shifting and moving my arms and everything. And you look like, like Mr. Burns. You're just like so fucking like upright, legs crossed. And every once in a while you do a little stretch with your little foot and that's about the most movement. Other than your one slip, you're unnervingly still when I watch the video. Really? Yeah, which made the sort of manipulation tactics feel even more That's intimidating. Not manipulation. You know I mean? I'm trying to communicate. I'm trying to get to. Yeah, but physicality is part of communication, Michael. So you think well, it's some kind of degeneracy that you think you share with the people who make you feel at home? I think there's just like a shared like need to be seen or understood that comes with people who do the types of things we do because there's no other reason to do it. Like it's degrading, it doesn't make you any money. You haven't made any money in show business? Uh, uh, com comparatively for How the, much money for the... have you made in show business? <laughs> uh, I've made close to a million pounds this year from show business. Fuck! Yeah, 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 yeah. Fuck! Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's difficult, it takes a lot of time, it alienates you from the other people in your life. So the only reason you would do this, this type of work or whatever creative output is if you feel bad if you don't and i think those people i don't think it's a thing of like oh, i only hang around with people who are fucked up like i don't like that actually but no. i just think because a lot of them aren't like a lot of them are really normal in the other ways but they also happen to have this thing where they're like i have a compulsion to tell people about myself or to try to explain things that i've been through to other people wow so you think that perhaps it's more nature than it is nurture you think there's a little bit of like a force within you to share and you find that appealing in other people as well rather than the result of what i was saying which is maybe that your experience of two sides of nuanced social and cultural conversations means that you're able to slip in places i think that's where it comes from for me but mm. i think other people can get to the same spot in other ways you know there's can be a you know like a white straight male oxbridge educated person who for whatever reason 
also was pushed to feel the same as I feel. Um, Which straight white man do you think you're most similar to? There must be one. There must be one that you see yourself in. It's not one of those pedo ones in Hollywood, is it? Eminem. Marshall Mathers. Yeah. Slim Shady. I, I, I don't think it's about, I don't think it's only people who don't feel they belong or only people who weren't emotionally supported by their family or only people who went through trauma when they were young or only people who had a super normal life and therefore need something different. I just think everybody gets there differently. But the thing that we share is this, like I said, whether it's a negative thing, whether it's narcissism or neuroses or whether it's like, a genuine want to make the audience feel something, you know, by describing human. I think whatever that is, I don't know what it is, but you can tell when someone has it. And I like hanging around those people because they, they have it as well. Wow. So for you, it's sort of the access to an awareness of these sort of liminal spaces, but for someone else, it might be something entirely different. Yeah, I think so, but I don't know what liminal means. The space in between. Yes. Uh, I, I yeah. I think this, the space in between thing is more of a like, um, uh, I think that has caused me to be a specific kind of way, but mm -hmm. I don't think I'm, I'm a hundred percent conscious of that when I'm doing, when I'm doing stuff, or when I'm hanging around with people, I think it has caused me to feel the need to explain myself, mm. but I'm not, I, I only became aware of that because other people started telling me I'm not up here being like, I don't fit in anywhere. Like I just feel how I feel, but my life experience is people saying to me, no, you're not like that, or no, you're not like this, or no. So I have to, I'm walking around experiencing life one way as myself, knowing that 99.9% .9 of people that experience me are not receiving the same thing, which is the same for everyone, but that's the way I came to learn it, was from people telling me. <laughs> They're like, no, nah, you're not like the rest of us. And again, not in a way where I'm like, I'm different, just in a like, that's just, was my experience. You looked physically uncomfortable with how long you were speaking. Yeah, I could, I, I could see myself being like, you, you haven't made a point, but you've been talking for a long time. Come back round, to, like say simpler words first of all. Tr stop trying to sound clever. Second of all, finish. The part of the point of the show is to Bust, sound ten out of ten. Part of the point of the show is to treat um, sounding clever with contempt. Like I obviously try and sound clever. That's part of the joke, right? Yeah but I try and do it in a way that's clear that like when I, when I fuck it up, I just say it with my chest. It's the whole show's kind of a comment on white privilege in a way. Really? Question two. Captain Backfire once said, I was 16 years old. Uh, I learned to play the uh, acoustic guitar because I was into emo music. And getting pussy. Uh, and obviously that as well. I'm busting 10 out of 10. Um, I'm saying pussy. Do you think it suits me? Yeah, you can say it. Really? Yeah, the nail polish and the talking about being bi on stage, it like buys you the thing. Sick. I'm a navy blue black sheep, vivid in green screen. Uh, it's not actually what he said. He said, I'm a navy blue black machine living in green screen. I'll take that one again. <laughs> Question two. Captain Backfire once said, I'm a navy blue machine. You can do it. I'm a navy blue black machine. Part of the point of the show is to treat um, sounding clever with contempt. I'm a navy blue black machine living living in green screen. There you go. Yeah. Yeah. I think this speaks to your ability to fit in. <laughs> but what I want to ask is what most stands out about you? This isn't a great question. Um, I didn't regularly make it clear. Only after I'd initially asked the question did I decide that there's probably different interpretations of it. And then you had to sort of deal with that. And so I just want to apologize for not a great question. I forgive you. What most stands out about me? Oh, man, I don't know. Uh, I suppose I can only answer that by talking about the, the thing that people tell me the most. Uh, I think. What do like, you think it is? What do I think it is? What do you like? What do you think most stands out about you? Um, I think I am um, funny. Yeah, but most people that meet you never know that. Oh, man. What most stands out about me? I suppose there's two possible interpretations of the question, if you don't mind me. Please, um, yeah, clarify for me. I'm struggling. I suppose the first possible interpretation of the question is... It feels like a trap because it stands out seems to be like 
it's either like, what do you think is good about you? Or complain about something that secretly you think is kind of cool about yourself. Do you know what I mean? Uh, a certain questions innately feel like a trap. You like it feels it was like... You a gotcha. You thought I was trying to say, no, hey, no, Rob, what it... stands out most about you? And then you were going to be like, probably my fat... Do uh, it, do it. Oh. Do it. Come on, boss. Cock. Yeah, there it is. <laughs> and, uh, and then I was going to be like, hey, Rob, that's not what I meant. I meant in a charitable sense. What stands what out about me? No, I, I just feel like the question itself, I understood why you asked the question, but it did feel like no matter what you say, what stands out about it? That's like, what's the best thing about it? Well, I guess it's not really. What's your biggest strength and weakness? Yeah, do you know what I mean? I, I, was, I didn't want the job and I wasn't going to answer the interview question, uh, but I did answer it. Yeah, it was a tough question, but I, 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 I fully believe you when you say it wasn't intentional. Hey, no tough questions, no tough answers. I think that probably the thing that stands out most about me is is my uh, like the way I look that I'm I'm not easily identifiable to look at. I think that's the thing that people notice a lot that like racially and sort of uh, I mean race is normally the first thing because that's what people think when they look at you. But people aren't e easily able to like get a get a read on me. We'll put up a graph of your um, ethnic composition. It's uh, forty five percent pizza. Yeah, 35% avocado, and then the rest is sushi. Question three. Comedian Rod Gilbert has a famous bit about luggage. If you were able to pack one of your worries into a suitcase and send it to the big barrage carousel in the sky, barrage. <laughs> the barrage carousel. I said the barrage carousel. You know That's what, what this bloody interview felt like, a barrage carousel. I yes. Said, I said barrage um, because I've got a blocked nose. That's no, excuse. you what? Shut <laughs> the fuck up. Excuse. Oh, because I've got a blocked nose. I've got a blocked nose. Worst politician excuse of all time. <laughs> Worst politician in an interview being like, no, I said that because. I've got a blocked nose. I messed up. Wait, hang on a second. Up. Even physically, what, when you've got a blocked nose, bar bar it doesn't even, it's not even one of the bar sounds that it gets. Say baggage. Barrage. Oh, you <laughs> like, baggage barrage. Easy. Barrage. What you can't say, uh, notoriously, as Monica found out, was the word fine. You can't say anything anymore. Which worry would you do away with? Uh, worrying if, if people like me or not. Do you think that holds you back at all? Yeah. Really? Yeah. It seems to me, just as a friend, that that's one of your primary driving forces and that's my driving force in the pursuit of artistic endeavor i would i would agree yeah i would agree all right cool um now uh, this is actually my favorite segment of the show this is when you get to ask me a question robert gilbert do you have a question for me oh shit i forgot i wanted to put it yeah i do have a question for you michael um what is your, do you have an intentional relationship with, or are you aware of, of your relationship with um, sincerity? Uh, which one of those questions would you like to ask? Well, I suppose like, you were like, well, which question do you want me to ask? And I was like, oh, okay, all right, you're trying to avoid ask, answering the question. So I'll ask a simple question. I know you're going to give me like a sort of comedy answer and then we'll move on because you have trouble being sincere. What's up? Do you think sincerity is? Uh, are you? Are you avoiding sincerity intentionally? Do you think that you avoid sincerity intentionally? No, I don't believe that there's any difference between being sincere and not being sincere. I think, in a way, you're always see it sort of revealing a truth about yourself. Yeah, but that's different to being sincere. I think that even the joke answer sometimes, which may be considered insincere is equally revealing. Yeah, but that's like saying, oh, even if someone's violent, it's just revealing how vulnerable they are on the inside. So yeah, but they've someone still got punched in the face. Like it doesn't it, Yeah, the problem is that what you're doing there is a false equivalence. It's absolutely not. I'm using uh, a effect upon the other analogous example. Yeah, but my insincerity is never physical violence. No, but it can have an effect on the person that you're speaking to. True. But how's that different from what the truth would have? That would also have an effect. Yeah, but it would be true. It wouldn't be intentionally avoiding telling the truth or portraying something else to avoid uh, telling the truth. Also, I don't think it's like a bad manipulative thing. I just think like it. I think it's a. I. I it's a bit. I think truth is a tricky idea. Why? 
worst Captain Backfire song title of all time. <laughs> all right, so we're moving on to... No, just because I made a joke, you can't get away with not answering that. You now still have to follow through on the answer. I don't have to do shit. This is my show. Quick fire questions. This is the final round. This is actually my favorite round of the show. Uh, falling on ice or surviving animal attacks? Falling on ice. Live forever at 60 or die forever at 60? Die forever at 60. Yeah, me too. Why? Because... Um, no, sorry, I wouldn't do that one. I'd do the other one. You'd live forever at sixty. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Fuck! Now you're making me think I'd live forever at sixty. Yeah, I'd live forever at sixty. Yeah, me too. I think because I'm, I'm like getting older, and when I was younger, I thought I would die quite young, and now I'm like, yeah, living forever at sixty would be great because at sixty, less is expected of you. You could just chill. If you know you're going to live forever, you're not worried about getting any older mm. than sixty. So you're not sixty when you know you're getting older is different to sixty, and you're never going to get any older. Favorite book, fiction only? Uh, my favorite book is American Pastoral by um, fuck, Philip, I always Roth. Forget. Philip Roth, correct. We've discussed this before. Have we? Yeah. Nice. Good I, always, choice. I always accidentally say Eli Roth, and so I get nervous when I'm coming up to the cover. That's up to fair. I love Philip Roth. I liked um, Zuckerman Unbound as my favorite. Oh, I haven't. I've read Portnoy's Complaint, and uh, I'm married to a communist, or my husband's a communist, or whatever one that is. Yeah, I married a communist. I married a communist, that's it. Favorite pair of pants. Favorite pair of pants. fiction only. <laughs> I've got a, uh, I've got a gray, uh, like pair that have like that. It's like an air pocket design, so that they're like oh, very yeah. breezy. You don't get like the swamp crotch thing. Where from? I can't remember. I think they're like Reebok. They came in a multi pack, but these were the only ones like this. They're like light gray and dark gray striped with like a black band, but they're they've got like. They're sort of dimpled and made of like gym top material, oh, so wow. that you like don't sweat and it doesn't get too hot. I like sort that of a lot. micro dimples. Yeah, I think so. Microfiber is that what they call it? No, that's what you wipe your glasses with. Like kind of like kind of silky to touch. Gore Tex. Gore Tex. I mean? No, that's no, that would be waterproof. That'd yeah. be crazy. Uh, fle uh, fit flex. Yeah, I like the Uniqlo stuff. Sort of. Yeah, 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 yeah. More like kind of like thin Under Armour. It just sounds douchey, doesn't it? It sounds like what it sounds like. My first reference point is Under Armour, which paints a certain kind of picture of a certain kind of person. No, you are an Under Armour guy. You're always talking about Under uh, Armour, and yeah. Gatorade, the yeah. Denver Broncos. Yeah. Any more? Favorite Emma Chamberlain video? Dunno. Favorite song on Trash Island by Tybo Digital Blade Neko 2K. I tried to listen to this whole fucking stupid. I couldn't find what I was like. There's going to be one on here that I at least mildly You're welcome to pick a track number if you prefer. No, I, I listened to it. I tried to find one that I liked. I for the purpose of this. Nice. Probably one colon one because it's the shortest one. Come on. Also the first track. It is the first one, track featuring Young Lean. Yeah. But I mean, I really wanted to like it, but it, I I don't like this slow tempo. Um, that style of music, I like higher tempo. Just hold on, I'll do a bladey one. Yeah, young and bossing. Ten out of ten. Go get sun to your friend. You never know this is gonna end. That's the auto tune bit. All right, thanks, Robert. Thanks, mate. At the end, when we were shaking hands, I kept the microphone out of my mouth when it definitely wasn't necessary. <laughs> Do you have anything you want to promote? You were on Killing Eve and Macbeth. Do you want to promote those? Yeah, the thing about those projects is they are struggling for publicity, so I should probably do a bit of promo um, here on your podcast at the Cavendish Arms. Um, yeah, let's not be ungrateful. This could be the biggest podcast in the world after I do Rogan. It's not even the biggest podcast I've been on. Um, yeah, I, I mean, I was on Killing Eve. I was on a show on Big Boys uh, on Channel 4. Um, I'm in a new Paramount Plus show called The Burning Girls. Um, I've got a couple of other things coming up, sketches. If you go on Instagram, like I take I, I take pictures of, I've got this thing called an hoodie. It's like a hoodie, but it's extra large on purpose to be funny. And sometimes I do dances wearing that. Um, my girlfriend, uh, Jennifer Kirby, uh, England's Rose, is in a play at the German Street Theatre um, called Madame Bovary. You should go and see that. <laughs> The thing is, these sunglasses aren't free.
you know anything about me, it's that I've got one milli in the bank. I'm not going to rhyme with wank. Going to keep these bars clean. Play D, sipping on lean. I'm bossing 10 out of 10. <laughs> <laughs>